Hello Internet and welcome to a short little video about the motto of the sea, the Birkenhead drill, women and children first. I thought about this recently and decided to sort of make a small video about how the term first arose. It was first used in a novel from 1860 where a captain on a sinking ship basically said that women and children in the lifeboats first, anyone else trying to get in, I will personally smash their heads in. But at this point it was then already an established fact. And when was it established? Well, it wasn't actually that long before that because it was in 1850. During the sinking of the HMS Birkenhead. But first, a little background. In the 19th century and before that actually up until the 20th century, it was definitely not common practice that a ship should have enough lifeboats for everyone on board. In fact, there was a strong line of thought who considered the fact that if a ship had lifeboats enough for everyone on board, that would mean that the ship would be overweighted down by these particular lifeboats and would in fact make the whole situation worse if there was a shipwreck rather than better, of course, considering how many people died in shipwrecks, this was up for debate. But the point is, there was just not the tradition of having enough lifeboats for everyone. It just didn't happen. So, in 1852, in February, the troop ship from the British Navy, HMS Birkenhead, was transporting troops from 10 different regiments down to the 8th Shoza War in South Africa. Now, I'm not going to go much into the Shoza War. It was one of those interminable colonial fights that the British fought in South Africa up until taking over the country fully after the Boer Wars of the early 20th century. However, this one was dragging out and it was felt that the local troops needed some support from home. So they took various elements of various regiments like the famous 74 and various others and sent them down to South Africa to support those already under the command of the local governor, Sir Harry Smith. And like every other troop ship back then, they also brought wives and children of either people living down there or, well, just from the soldiers and officers about to go down there. Overall, the ship was supposed to be carrying around 650 people, probably around 500 soldiers and about 150 women and children though the actual percentages is hard to say. Most of the voyage from Portsmouth to South Africa was completely normal and very uneventful, the Birkenhead being a modern day paddle steamer, so the trip was done both faster and honestly more pleasant than it used to be back in the days of sail and wood. However, on the 26th of February, nearing Danger Bay, the ship who was traveling in calm water and taking soundings all the time while moving at about 8 knots an hour hit an uncharted submerged rock. Unfortunately it was calm water because it's apparently a rock that can be fairly easily seen in stronger seas. The waves hit over on top of it but in calm seas it's almost impossible to see. The captain of course did the only real important thing to do in such a situation. He reversed the engines and tried to back off that rock. Unfortunately, in this case, that was a terrible decision because most of the bow had been caved in and water immediately flooded the forward parts of the ship. In fact, as this was around six in the morning and a lot of soldiers were still sleeping, almost a hundred men drowned almost immediately in their cots as their sleeping quarters were flooded by incoming seawater. Less than 20 minutes later the ship was basically going down. There was no saving it. So the commander of the troop detachment marshaled his men on the deck and basically told them to stand there and don't move an inch while the women, children and assorted passengers were moved into the lifeboats. Now the lifeboats of the ship could carry probably around 300 people but several of them were not well maintained and and were found to be useless. So in the end there were about two large lifeboats, each capable of carrying so much that about 150 people could be saved. Now even with the 100 people drowned and another 100 below deck trying desperately to man the pumps, that left quite a lot of people who would not be able to get into the lifeboats and whose prospects were to 
put it mildly, troublesome. And yet the discipline amongst the men who it's worth noticing, most of them were actually newly hired recruits rather than veterans, were really, really iron solid. A survivor later accounted something like, almost everyone kept silent, nothing was heard by the kicking of the horses, there were some cavalry troops on board, and the orders of Lieutenant Colonel Seaton, all given in a clear, firm voice. He was the head of the military attachment aboard the ship. Eventually, the boats were lowered and the women and children were beginning to be ferried onto shore when the final doom of the ship came as it basically cracked in two. At this point, Salmon, the captain of the ship, gave the order of every man for himself and also decisively asked the men to swim for the boats, swim for the boats to save themselves. Colonel Seaton, however, realizing that that many men, there were still more than 300 troops marshaled on the deck and more was coming up from the lower parts of the ship that could, would probably capsize them and mean doom for everyone, in a loud, clear voice, gave out the order to stand fast and do not obey that order. Order. And apart from three of the soldiers, they all obeyed. Almost 400 men stood like rocks as the ship went down. Most of them were eventually cast into the sea and some of them tried to swim for shore about three miles away but the sharks were already in the area and of course at the time being able to swim was not exactly a universal skill so in the end only about 193 people were saved which include all of the women and children in the lifeboats about 150 160, as well as about 30 or 40 soldiers who somehow managed to either cling to floating pieces of the wreck or somehow managed to swim ashore. The next morning the schooner Lioness arrived and saved what could be remained, but as you can imagine, the sight of 400 soldiers standing in perfect rank and at ease while the ship was sinking directly into the ocean making absolutely no move and accepting their death with such calm in order to save well both their and their comrades women and children so as not to capsize their lifeboats caught the imagination of the people at home in England and across the world the highest ranking officer who survived the shipwreck by swimming ashore was breveted major despite being a captain who hadn't really done anything and multiple paintings were painted of the whole thing and multiple authors as we mentioned in the beginning wrote stories about it. Kipling wrote a famous poem about 40 years later that mentioned this as the Birkenhead drill which it has later gone down in history as, namely women and children first. Of course most famous of these were the Titanic and other shipwrecks in the beginning of the 20th century. But it began on the 26th of February 1852 with the HMS Birkenhead and the immense courage and self-sacrifice of the troops that were willing to sacrifice themselves with such courage. Uh, and it, to finish off everything, the Eight Shores of War lasted for another year or so before it petered out. Harry Smith, who was otherwise an actually fairly gallant man, was probably not really meant to be Governor General of South Africa. He was eventually recalled and his successor suppressed the rebellion while also creating the possibility for some kind of reconciliation and British control over South Africa went further a piece as it was, of course, historically meant to do. But that was the shipwreck of the HMS Birkenhead in 1852 and the origins of the term women and children first during shipwrecks. May we honor their memory. Until next time, I have been the Sage and I wish you all a very happy day.